So good evening again and welcome to Conversation about Environmental Justice. I have with us here Professor Christine Morales and Professor Marianne Bischoff, who are exciting folks that you're going to hear from this evening, this afternoon. Um, so I just want to give a little intro of who they are, but as we go through, please feel free to, if you want to ask a question, if you want to write it in the chat, we don't want you to feel like this is just a, a presentation, you're in a class. So please feel free to you know, jump in here and say, hey, I have a question, um, because we really want you all to engage in this, this critical topic of environmental justice. So I'm gonna go ahead and introduce our speakers and I'm gonna get out of your way so you'll be able to hear from them. But Christine Morales is an assistant professor of teaching at Rutgers School of Social Work. She received her MSW at the University of Southern California and is currently a doctoral student at Rutgers Graduate School of Education. Christine worked in foster care adoption and out of home care in California and in New Jersey. She teaches in the BSW and MSW programs here at Rutgers, and she teaches diversity and oppression, social work practice and environmental justice. Christine is personally and professionally motivated to promote environmental justice. It's one of her passions as she was born and raised in close proximity to an incinerator and a sacrifice zone. So I want to welcome to the stage Professor Christine Morales. If you give them a wave so they know who you are. She's like, I'm not waving. Oh, there she is. Okay. And then our second presenter is going to be Professor Marianne Bischoff, who is also an assistant professor here at Rutgers School of Social Work. And she's a faculty member in management and policy field education coordinator. And she runs a small private practice. She earned her, mom, her MSW from Monmouth University. Ooh, ooh, we both went to Monmouth. Um, she earned her MSW from Monmouth University with a concentration in international community development. She has an MS from Cornell University in soil and water engineering inter and international development. And she has held positions as clinical supervisor, Catholic Charities, at Catholic Charities, clinical case manager at um, Carrier Clinic, executive director of Mills on Wills of Greater New Brunswick, and at Ford Motor Company. She was a finance coordinator, a human resource associate, and a quality engineer. So Professor Bischoff, or Mary Ann, applies to social work, the formal analytic analytical disciplines of systems, root cause, risk analysis, and hones in her previous careers in engineering and international agriculture, coupled with her spiritual practice of interbeing in the tradition of Thich Nhat Hanh. Her areas of interest do include environmental justice, decolonization, mindfulness, and trauma. So I have introduced our speakers. I'm going to get out of the way. Y'all, please feel free to try, type in the chat if you have questions, or even if you want to speak, you can put your hand up, and Christine and Marianne will be welcome to hear from you. So I'm turning it over to my esteemed colleagues here, and I will be on the line with you. Thank you so much, Natalie, and welcome everyone. I hope you can relax and settle in and that you find this a fun and engaging and uh, stimulating topic. So as we get started, we'd like to acknowledge that Rutgers University operates on the traditional unceded territory of the Lene Lenape people. And I hope you find this quote from indigenous social worker, Le worker Leah Prussia as powerful as we do. Here's the quote. Just as the seasons shift and migration patterns modify in response to human impact, so too must social work. Along with the human contingency silenced by oppression, climate change, dis climate change disproportionately burdens the voiceless. The rooted, nibby, water, aki, earth, winged, four-legged, swimmers, and crawlers. And then we're going, Steen, I call her Steen, is gonna share her screen. And we're going to, um, there's a quote that I'd like to share with you. So there it is. And it says, when I dare to be powerful, use my strength in the service of my vision, then it becomes less and less important whether I am afraid. And that's by Audre Lorde, who is an amazing woman um, and a poet. And um, I thought it might be inspiring because sometimes when we look at 
hard things that there are to do, it can feel scary. And I, I had a postcard that was had this quote on it, but it looked different. I carried it around for me with me for over 10 years and found it pretty inspiring. Thanks, Marianne. So I'm, I'm curious for those of you folks out there, by show of hands, um, how many of you have heard of uh, land acknowledgement before? Whether it was the actual term land acknowledgement or an actual land acknowledgement that you heard. Thanks, Kim. Anyone else? So I do know that land acknowledgement is are becoming um, more used in like workshops and conferences. And so I wanna encourage us to move past land acknowledgements. I think that's a good first step and move towards living land acknowledgements. So basically what we wanna do is encourage more than just performative um, Acts. So a living land acknowledgement is really about creating relationships with um, groups who have been historically marginalized and working intentionally with them um, in whatever goals that they have and any sort of community action that they need support from us for. So that's just my piece about uh, land acknowledgements. And here, just gonna talk about our introductions. We're gonna talk about us. I think it's really important that you get a sense of who we are. I think who we are is as important as what we talk about and how we talk about it. So Marianne and I love to share our like origin story. I know some movies call it like the cute meat or the meat cute, right? Where, how did they find each other? So Marianne and I do a lot of work together, a lot of projects together. And we were literally at a water cooler. And um, is this happened? so many years ago and we share so many experiences and memories we forget who said what um, in an interaction but one of us said like isn't it strange that we had to pay for water and it's a free resource and so we started talking about the inequity the commodity commodification of resources. And then I, I had acknowledged, I said, you know, I never taught, I never learned about environmental justice in my MSW program, did you? And she was like, no, I didn't either. And I was like, do we teach that at Rutgers School of Social Work? And uh, we found out the answer was no. And um, I think the quote that Marianne opens with is even more uh, meaningful to us because we came up with this idea like, oh, let's teach it. Let's teach it at the school. And there was a lot of, um, I think, hesitation on, on our parts because as we've said, we, we didn't learn about it from our school. So we did a lot of learning on our own. And as we teach the class and as we have workshops like this, which I hope you all engage with us, we learn more and more. So um, we hope that you bring your expertise to this uh, workshop today. Marian. Thanks, Dean. So yeah, I feel like nature was a part of my life growing up. My dad had us out in nature all the time. He had a huge garden, almost a field that we were weeding and eating fresh green beans from the garden. I would go fishing with my dad and hunting for small animals and hunting for frogs legs and I could um, kill the animals and cook them and eat them. And it was all done with a reverence and an acknowledgement of a cycle of life. And really there was just a, it was a spiritual thing really to really be that connected to nature. And I also felt like um, I would go outside, especially from my grandmother's house and go into the woods. There was a huge rock. We called it the rocket because you could kind of just sit on it when it seemed like a rocket. And all the, any sadness I had, especially in adolescence, I felt like nature was really holding it for me. That huge rock, the rocket was holding it, the trees, I would lean against the trees. And I really felt there was something greater than myself that I was part of. I didn't exactly have the words for it. That, that kind of came later. A lot of it came when I got to know Thich Nhat Hanh's teachings. And it sort of put words to it, like the idea of that we're, we inter are. So, we in, it's like kind of interbeing that we're really that interconnected with each other. And so when the opportunity came up or when Christine and I created the opportunity to make the environmental justice class, it just felt like everything was coming together the way it was supposed to. 
And yeah, I was like, I don't know how to do this, but really I thought of Audre Lorde and she was a poet and she was at Hunter University and um, there was no one teaching poetry and she didn't know how to teach poetry, but no one else was doing it. And she did it with her fear. She moved forward. And so I felt inspiration and kinship with her. Thanks, Maria. So luckily we have a small group. I don't know if you can tell already, we're like, come in with us, join us. We try not to talk at you. I know that that can be a little bit boring, especially on a, a rainy day if you are where we are and we don't want to put anyone to sleep. So we're going to actually be pretty engaged. At least I, I hope so, or I try to be. We're going to do a few activities. I am gearing you up for your first one. Uh, we would... I, ideally, we would sit around the table and we would do introductions. We would really get to know each other and we would learn from each other just by our relationships as social work has taught us. Um, but given like the time and the amount of people, what we actually would like you to do, if you can open up the chat, go ahead and find the chat box. And um, in the chat box, I want you to ready your response, okay? And don't hit enter yet. I want you all to hit enter at the same time when I say go. Hopefully I'm not setting myself up here. <laughs> so don't hit enter, just start typing the answer to my question, which is, can you share an animal that either you most like or that you're most like, maybe an animal that you identify with, or, you know, if you don't identify with any animal, what animal comes to mind? Ready? So give it a second. Let's everyone have a chance to think about it, find the chat function. And I'm going to say in five, four, three, two, one, go ahead, hit enter. Wow, yay. A puffin. A sloth. <laughs> yes, I'm feeling that, Daniel. Elephant, dragonfly. These are awesome answers. Cat, small dog. Yes, thank you so much. Lion, lion. Yes. <laughs> Awesome. So you already see that we have things in common. Okay, lioness, I get is not the same as a cat, but there's like a connection there. Small dog, dogs, right? So thank you. Just uh, something fun to think about. If we had time, I'd ask you what it is that connected you to them, but just something for you to, to ponder on, to think about. All right. All right. So now that I have you warmed up, we actually do have another exercise. So let me open up this um, word cloud. Uh, let's see. So I think you're all familiar with Poll Everywhere. I'm gonna fix my screen in a second. So this Poll Everywhere question is uh, limited to one word. And so what I'm asking you to enter is the one word you think of when you hear the term environmental justice. And in order to participate, Marianne, uh, my, my dear, dear friend, put the link in the chat below. <laughs> you could respond by clicking on the link below. You can go to pollev.com poll and enter Christine, M-O-R, 715. That feels a little cumbersome. Or you can um, text, to the number 37607, Christine, M-O-R-715, and you can text in your answer. So that's the instructions. I'll give it another second before I start showing the responses. Okay. Oh, wow, I already see overburdened, thank you. As you type in your words, they'll, they'll appear in the cloud. Natalie, feel free to participate. Green. Mm -hmm. Again, you can find the link in the chat. That's probably the easiest. Trees, innovative solar panels. 
Oh, solar panels, I think, is meant together. <laughs> One else? We have a small but mighty group. I know when we have larger, um, like larger audiences when we're doing this, like words will get bigger as they are repeated. So I'm imagining that green was said at least twice. Right. Yeah. Care, heal, earth, nature. Yeah. This is great. Marianne, is anything jumping out at you? Yeah, it's interesting. Like some things are are simply about nature, and some things are about um the injustice, like overburden, the, the need to heal or cure things, and about the people involved, a potential solution, solar panels and the innovation, the need for innovation and education. So I like it that as a community, we came up with all the different aspects or many, many, many of the different aspects of how this can be approached and, and what really makes up environmental justice. Thanks, Marianne. I do love to open it up. So I'm encouraging if anyone has any reactions or responses to the poll everywhere, um, can feel free to share. If anything's coming to mind. As you guys might be thinking about sharing or not, I just want to say to you, Christine, don't go to the next slide until I say a few things because I okay. want to do it that way. Thank no you. No problem. I won't go until I'll stay here until you <laughs> tell me to go. Thanks. Any thoughts? No pressure. All right, well, thank you so much for participating. And um, the reason I don't wanna to go to the next slide is because it sort of gives kind of like an answer in a sense. Um, so what we wanna talk about now is definitions of environmental justice. And I was reading one of Christine's papers that she was writing for her PhD, and I just loved her definition of environmental justice. And it was, I felt so much better than the ones we were reading from the EPA and ones like that. So that's what's on the next slide is, is her definition that just came out of her like naturally. But the EPA definition I'm gonna read to you now, it says environmental justice is the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin or income with respect to the development, implementation and enforcement of environmental laws regulations and policies. So I don't know if you have any reactions to that. So I wanna point out the meaningful involvement of all people. And then with relation to development, et cetera, et cetera, of environmental laws, et cetera. That's kind of the structure of it for me. Now, Steen, I don't know if you wanted to talk about um, socio-environmental conditions or can we go to the slide first? yeah let me let me head over to the slide okay so now you're gonna see christine's definition yikes let me get to let me adjust my screens thanks for going back and forth with all these things no problem i feel like i should be a pro at this point in the zoom world we're living in um, so okay um Marianne and I, we talk to people in other disciplines and people who are doing the work, um, activists who are possibly social workers or not necessarily social workers. And we saw that some people were like environmentalists and other people were very much focused on um, human health and condition. I think I give it away too much or maybe I give it away too soon, but I think it's really important to understand Marianne and I, we have have a shared perspective, I think, which really connects us really well, is that um, we see connection in everything. So like, yes, micro, meso, macro has its like specific like 
tracks and things to understand, but we believe that micro can exist without meso, which can exist without macro. So there's like permeable barriers. And so I was starting to get this idea of like invent environmentalism versus human condition versus environmental justice. So, you know, when we talk about environmental justice, we're talking about, and this is what I created, created the um the well-being of the earth its ecosystems and its inhabitants and i said it that way to be as all-encompassing as possible for environmentalists to be like yeah we want to work in that area for social workers to say yes we want to work in that area for biological scientists to say yes this is something that we are interested in as well in fact we're even intentional um we say a lot um socio-environmental conditions or crisis rather than just climate change. So socio-environmental conditions, it's, it, it's, it does include climate change, but it's also about like human activity, human relationship and its impact on earth and vice versa, earth's um, impact and the ecosystem's impact on humans. Um, so it's really like this kind of reciprocal idea that we're trying to get across. Mary, did I miss anything? No, does anything jump out to any of our participants? You wanna feel free to jump in, put something in the chat or just unmute and tell us what you think. Give you a second, no pressure. Yeah, for me, like it's just, this is about environmental justice, well being of the earth. So not just about people, about the earth, its ecosystems, and its inhabitants, which is way more than people. Yeah. And I think you all, um, I was going to say, Marianne, I realized I was going to say hit the nail on the head, but I'm realizing that's violent. So you're, <laughs> so you're all, um, I think, pretty accurate with, and as Marianne was talking about, kind of getting at like uh, root causes when we were doing the word cloud, its impact, um, what's happening right now, as well as solutions. And that's what we encompass as well when we think about environmental justice. So, okay. Is it time for the film? It's time. It's time for the short trailer. <laughs> Okay, um, I again more background. Everyone's like, all right, Christine, you said you don't like to lecture at us. So um, it was really serendipitous and I was really excited. Um, when I was teaching environmental justice for the first time, um, it was over in Newark on a Newark campus. And I was looking for uh, ways to, to talk about this topic that yes, takes it seriously, but also keeps that hope so that my students feel that they could make a change, that they can make a difference. And um, it was serendipitous because an event came up that I became aware of um, over in the Heinz building in Newark. Um, in the Action Lab. And so essentially there was a documentary that Julia Winokur had filmed and it's called The Sacrifice Zone. And she is actually depicting Newark. And so well, my class and I, we did a, a field trip and we got to see this film live. And then we also got to speak to the person that it centers around and the organization that it centers around. So this film is about an hour long. Um, it is available thanks to the work of Marianne and myself. We did make it available through the library. I'm sorry, that was ego. Thanks to the librarians. <laughs> This film is now um, available for you all to watch like full length um, over at Rutgers Library. So let me see. I'm going to stop sharing real quick. And as Dean is, is uh, queuing it up, I just wanted to say that this work can be hard. It can be nourishing and it can be hard and many other things. And so I feel like some of what we have to do in, in the movement of working on environmental issues or climate issues is to be able to sit with hard feelings and not always feel like we have to jump to act right away. I feel like we're smarter when we when we sit with those feelings for a bit and connect with others and then act intentionally. 
So to that yeah. end, after the after the um, the clip, the trailer, I'm going to lead a breathing mindfulness exercise. Okay, Marianne, can you just shout out that you can hear it or not? Okay, I will shout out. I hear it. Around our country, we're replete with examples of certain communities basically becoming warehouses for toxic facilities. Most of the industrial legacy for the city of Newark lies in the iron bound. There's just so many things in a concentrated area that's less than a mile from where all the residents are. You're not just breathing in one chemical at a time or one pollutant at a time. You're exposed to a barrage of pollutants. We're the ones that live with the impacts of mass consumption. People think you need a hurricane to do this. We don't. We just need a day full of rain. And not everyone lives this way. We're seeing incidents of high levels of congenital heart failure, of asthma, and children having learning disabilities. I can't call it anything else but a sacrifice zone. A zone that's been deemed these lives don't matter as much. We can't keep sitting back and letting generations be affected by this. To create change, you can't let anybody take away your power or your community's power. Body, 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 body. Pretty powerful. Any anyone want to share how that landed on you? Yeah. Thanks, Natalie. Just thinking about the rain, how it's impacting those communities. Yeah. All right. Well, um, we'll go into our meditation. So um, I encourage you to be in whatever position is comfortable for you at the moment and um, notice whatever you're sitting on, a chair or a couch or lying in a bed, the support that you're getting under your bottom, your back, your feet, and notice any sounds, smells, tastes, the temperature of the air. And allow yourself to notice your breathing you don't need to change it in any way i think when we start noticing something it changes automatically so that's okay too and then i'll just guide you in this meditation breathing in i see myself as a flower breathing out i feel fresh in flower out fresh so you can take a few breaths saying flower on the in breath and fresh on the out breath now breathing in i see myself as a mountain breathing out I feel solid in mountain out solid now breathing in I see myself as calm water breathing out i reflect things as they are in calm water out reflecting And finally, breathing in, I see myself 
as the spacious blue sky. Breathing out, I feel free. In, spacious, out, free. And the mindfulness that you may have been feeling during the guided meditation, you can invite to stay with you in whatever amount or capacity feels right. And you can certainly revisit it at other times. Thank you for breathing with me. Thanks, Marianne. So I'm wondering if we've given others um, enough time to reflect on that video and I kind of want to open it back up to any reactions, any thoughts that came up as they watched it, anything that jumped out at them. Okay. All right, so environmental justice and social work. So I don't know about you guys, but whenever I have an ethical dilemma, which can happen doing clinical social work, macro social work, or in education, or many other parts of my career as a social worker, I consult our code of ethics, and I feel really lucky to have it. In fact, I was at a family gathering slash reunion for like extended family and was talking to someone who's a counselor and he was having quite an ethical dilemma. And I said, do you have a code of ethics that you could consult? Um, because they're not really easy answers. So it's really a big part of how I use that code is to, to go to it. And so when we started our work in environmental justice and developing our course, we said, oh, what does the code of ethics say? What does the Council on Social Work Education say? These are sort of policy questions. These policies help guide us and maybe we would even wanna change them if we didn't think they covered it enough. So on the left, you see six principles that are part of our code of ethics, service, social justice, dignity and worth of the person, importance of human relationships, integrity and competence. And I'm wondering if maybe you can put in the chat, which of those six principles do you think environmental justice might fall under? I'll give you a minute. As you're doing that. Um, okay. Kim says all, thank you, Kim. All of them says Daniel. Social justice, Bashir, thanks. Social justice, Kelsey. Yeah, so that's kind of the way Christine and I thought of it. It really falls under all of them and social justice is the one that kind of popped out to us first and most strongly. Our code of ethics also has ethical standards and number six is social workers ethical responsibility to the broader society under their 6.01 is social welfare. So even though um, there wasn't the word environmental justice in the code when we were when we were developing this, we still felt that it was part of our ethical responsibility to teach about environmental justice and to work as social workers to work towards environmental justice. Thanks, Marianne. So I want to um, before I move forward, I think I'm like rewinding a little bit. Marianne's like, "What's happening? What are we doing?" I just want to go back to like socio-environmental conditions in crisis and thinking about like the populations that social workers are, are known to serve. It's groups that have been systemically oppressed, uh, groups that have experienced injustice. And so these forms of um, injustice, we see them as not happening in isolation, much like how we conceptualize micro 
micro, meso, and macro practice, right? As we saw in the video, areas that are typically experiencing, let's say, like racism or socioeconomic um, um, backlash, as well as like even ableism, all, all the isms that you can think of. Um, environmental justice also or injustices uh, can be seen or can manifest in those areas as well. So essentially they do not happen in isolation. And that's one of the reasons that we believe that social workers are well equipped to join in the fight for environmental justice because we're already in the areas, you know, doing that work. So when I ask students like, so how, what would you wanna know about environmental justice? What I hear a lot is like examples. I wanna know who's doing work and how. And um, we've been thinking about, can, are there social workers we can name? And I'm sure there are many that are involved. The tricky part is though much of this work is community action and, um, just how I aired my error in saying, oh, we brought this video to you, right? It was actually community action. It was librarians. It was, of course, the producers and certainly the um, Ironbound Community Corporation, which is the organization that's centered in the in the documentary. So it's hard to pinpoint like one specific example, but I know that Many of the articles that we have or that we've read have examples of programs where social workers are employed um, and they are either um, facilitating or they are providing these programs or even in cases where they're creating programs. And it's not just programs, it's also like influencing policy. So what I have for you in this slide is just kind of examples um, of some of the skills and opportunities social workers have to work in the capacity of environmental justice. Now, all of these are taken from readings and we'll just uh, go ahead and read it. Um, social work can address environmental uh, justice issues by implementing and evaluating programs, researching best practices, and engaging with existing environmental groups and organizations. Like we could talk about these three points all day. Um, I feel I have an, um, an, anecdote, an anecdote for each one of these points, but the one that, um, Marianne, are you thinking about the same one as I am with theory? Where um, Marianne and I went to a conference um, like what, six years ago? So, yeah. This conference on, um, environmental justice and social workers. And they were talking about like sea level rising. I remember vividly because we were sitting on the floor because there were no more seats. And the social work professor was talking very knowledgeably about sea level rise and its impact on clients and people. And I looked over at Marianne and I was like, wait a minute, this is like the X number of workshop that we attended today but nobody's talking about theory. <laughs> and your aunt's like, who cares? Well, not exactly in the Yes, words. I was, you can say it. <laughs> and I was like, come on, we gotta be grounded in something. We have to be grounded in something. And so Marianne and I started to do the research and we found that there are theories out there. Um, with various practices that social workers are doing. Many of them are abroad in like Canada, in the UK and Australia. Uh, but if, if you do the research, you'll find that there are um, many examples. You can also join existing groups uh, in your local community. I had um, an urban farmer come talk to my class one week. I've worked with him on other projects, but when he came to the class, he was telling his story it was so gripping he's just so awesome and the students were like you know we're really overwhelmed by this how do we get started and he was like you just start in your community start where you live start participating finding organizations that exist out there and um, just finding a space for yourself Marianne 
Yeah, I mean, I felt similar to how you felt, but I wasn't looking for theory. I was looking for a way to categorize everything and because um, it just felt so big. And so I think what Christine and I ended up doing sort of a model and it incorporated the theories that really Christine uncovered three different theories that have totally different approach. And then it incorporated the different levels you could be working on. You can work on yourself, which would be the personal level of your connection to nature, to justice on micro, meso, macro levels. And so I think we both had the same need. And, and, and then we started teaching some continuing education courses when the course we developed didn't fill up enough and didn't run um, for a while. And we noticed that people who really had a connection to nature, they also were working in policy related to environmental justice. And so it all kind of feeds itself, but it can still feel overwhelming. Like if you even if you're working on issues of poverty or or interpersonal violence that can feel overwhelming in the same way. And I think both of us needed to find ways to sort of, I don't know if it's exactly break it down into manageable sections, but but see how it all inter interacts with, see how people are working in different areas and how those in, in, um, affect each other and support each other. And the other thing I wanted to say is, there's not a roadmap, like there's not a roadmap probably for anything in life. We think there is maybe cooking can have some roadmaps. You have a recipe, but there's not a roadmap to this environmental justice work. So you kind of have to figure it out as you go and just, you know, use your critical thinking, critical thinking brain and compassionate heart and say what makes the most sense to do now. I recently got sucked into something that I needed to work needed to be done related to the environment and humans connection to it. And I didn't really have a chance to look to see how does anyone else do this? It was just like, okay, what's the right next step? How do we bring people together? How do we see if people are on the same page? How do we leverage that the, the common passions that people have? Um, who has what resources or who knows, who knows what connections and how can we make this happen? And so it can feel scary, like this is big and how do I start on it? And it just is what it is. It's just the next thing. You just figure out the next thing that's in front of you to do and find other people to work with and connect with and people you feel comfortable asking questions of and getting their ideas. Yeah. So I'm also realizing that I was, before I talked about the sacrifice zone, I was introducing it as, you know, a way to stay hopeful. And I think a lot of the hope generated from the panel discussion that the class trip had. Um, so we went to go see the film and afterwards there was a panel discussion and the activist Maria, who's um, focused the, who is the focus in the film, she was present and they were asking her questions. And I recall this, she had said, the question was, how can you continue to do this work when it's so hard and when there's um, slow to little reward? And, um, you know, she even made a gesture. She was like, you know, I don't do this work alone. She said, I do it with a, with a group of people. And when I feel like I need to step away, she says she just falls back. And she says that she's comforted knowing that the group of people that she works with continues to take up that, that effort without her. And then her promise to them is that when she's ready, that she rejoins them. So to Marianne's point, it really is about community work. Um, and as social workers, we're also going to see things like, you know, climate anxiety. I know that's something that um, um, psychiatrists are looking into now or eco-anxiety. Um, and then also I wanted to point out in the PowerPoint that Dylan said that social workers can take, and now these are just examples, um, but Dylan describes a combative role um, which is community fighting against social, economic, and environmental threats, and also an educational role, which is um, what social workers do to help foster collectivity. So really social workers can make sure that people have adequate and accessible housing. Some of you are already doing this work, sustenance, um, education, and opportunities to participate, participate in meaningful 
civic engagement. And civic engagement is more than just voting, which is important. It's um, so many different things. Jury duty comes to mind. <laughs> Participating in community um, events as well. There's a large variety. Any thoughts, reactions? Anyone disagree? Speaking of disagreeing, I like um, to, I don't, I don't like, I need to talk about how there's a lot of divisiveness and polarization in the US now. And I, it comes, it also impacts like our work for the environment. So I feel like it's a lot easier to get people on the same page when we talk about wanting to have clean water and clean air and not have communities go underwater when it rains than it is to say, uh, how do we combat climate change? Because there's groups of people that aren't sure there really is climate change or don't care if there is or not, but feel like it's being used to control us. And to me, the issue of the environment is so big that we really need to get on the same page. So I work very hard. It just sort of comes naturally to me, I guess, because I like when everyone's together, I feel safer, I guess, and happier. Um, and so I like to find ways to talk about the environment that really connects us all because we really all are connected to the environment and earth without it, we can't live. So that's something to think about. And then I ask us to, to use our, our critical thinking and not just accept narratives. What comes to my mind is uh, everyone's like, oh yeah, we have to get electrical vehicles. They're so much better for the environment. And I'm not sure that people who say that really know it takes quite an analysis to look at if an environment, if an electric vehicle is better, like get rid of your gas car and get an electric vehicle. You have to think about where does the bat, all the chemicals and minerals that are in the battery, where do they come from? And uh, it's sort of an analysis from beginning to end where you get all the materials for either type of car and then how long they last, how efficient they are when you're using them. And then how do you, dispose of them in the end. So um, I just think that we're, we're smart enough as social workers, we've seen power imbalances in all different ways that we can apply that to how we look at environmental work too. And we don't have to have all the answers, we don't, it's too big. It's, it's about having the right questions and bringing people together. Marianne, so I'm seeing in the, in the chat, there's a question. Um, Kelsey asks, how do you combat people feeling hopeless about the climate and feeling like it's pointless for them to try to do anything at this point? I mean, what comes to my mind is that that's, that's something's wrong if we're feeling hopeless about something. I mean, that I feel jerked around when I start to feel hopeless. I feel like I'm, I'm being controlled somehow. Um, and so I want to reframe it and find, I don't, I don't know where, like, I know there's messages that, that I myself has, have shared, oh, there's only 10 years left. If we don't do anything, everything's gonna fall apart. And now looking back, it seems like I was kind of part of the problem as I was voicing that, because if we do feel hopeless, then we're, first of all, we're miserable and then we're, we're not able to do anything. So I would kind of talk about it the way I am right now and say there's so much that we can do in the micro. When we're looking at national and global politics, it's really easy to feel powerless, but there's so much that can happen on local levels in towns that can be so nourishing. Like you connect with people that care about the same things and maybe they're so different than you in other ways. And that's like, for me, so energizing and beautiful. So I think people say, look to the helpers. I say, look to, you know, look to the helpers, but also look to where your points of power are and what you can do and, and do the work that nourishes you at the same time. So even if it is all going to end in the meantime, I want to be working on something that nourishes me that makes things a little better or a lot better right where I'm at. Yeah. So I think my response is a little bit different, Marian. I love your points. And, you know, I think when, when people feel hopeless, I can really relate to that um, when I'm just feeling a little bit overwhelmed by things. 
And, um, you know, I've heard the term and I said, it. I think recently that misery loves company. And I think that that's kind of, I, I, I wish I could rephrase it and still keep it a popular adage. I want to say something maybe like misery is healed by community. Uh, I, I don't know. I feel like when I'm talking to somebody, when I'm sad, I reach out to someone regardless of what's happening um, or what it's related to. I, I call a trusted friend. I I make it a point to, even though it probably feels better or seems right at the time to stay in my cozy bed, you know, I make it a point to connect with people, to connect with others. And they usually, I don't, they usually make me feel better. It's these relationships where we can, it's using those clinical skills that we're learning, we're acknowledging individuals' feelings, we're recognizing them as real, and we're seeing what's causing them. But then we're also helping them reframe to understand like what capacities do they have that they can make small changes in. And I think that's when we're working with others and their feelings of hopelessness. For social workers, I mean, the reality is the work that we do is really around human suffering, about, around like challenges that people have. So what I tell most of social work students that I work with is to find those small joys, find those small successes. And then once you start focusing on them, they don't feel so small anymore and they don't seem so small anymore. And the other piece is also finding a balance because yes, we acknowledge these feelings. Yes, we have responsibility, but we also want to be clear that, you know, there is a, a there are corporations and industries that are responsible. And I know that we can feel powerless around them, but I believe in like consumer, collective consumer power. I mean, take for example, if society decides they're no longer going to purchase like Furbies, they'll stop making Furbies, right? I mean, that's just an example that I'm thinking about. So we have the capacity as individuals and as groups to make changes, which have impacts on other things that lead to bigger changes, so. Does um, anyone know do what Furbies are? I'm always <laughs> behind in these things. <laughs> I'm like, was that made a made up word or something? I'm supposed to know what it is. <laughs> I've seen a lot of questions. So uh, the beautiful Natalie asked us, what do we need to know to engage in these, uh, criti in this, these critical works and where do we start? Oh man, you know, that's a really good question, Natalie. You know, I, you don't have to know everything, I think. I think it's, that's, it's, a, it's pretty odorous. I think it would be for me to feel like I need to be the expert on something and know every detail about something. I just um, am a facilitator in the sense that I know where to find it. And even if I knew the, the detail that I needed to know, it's very likely I, I might forget it. Uh, so it's having the core group of people that I can work with. It's knowing what I want to do is probably a really good start. What is most meaningful to you? What is most impactful in your life? And how can you incorporate that into your work? Marianne, I don't know if you want to add to that. Um, what is most meaningful to me? Um, no, so um, how do you start, in, where do you start in engaging um, in like the critical work? Yeah, I feel like it's just when when the, the next thing comes up, like I was saying before, I put your critical thinking hat on and be like, hmm, what could be unintentional consequences here? How much was the community involved? It's kind of like the same questions again and again. Um, is that is the community really involved? What could go wrong um, with this? Like just I know it's an overused trite example, but the plastic bag ban. I have over a hundred very thick plastic bags that from um, from Whole Foods. My kids order groceries from Whole Foods, and they come now. They're not allowed to give us paper bags anymore because of the plastic bag ban. 
and those could be reused and we we use them for things in the garden and stuff like that but now they they have to give you a reusable one i don't know i literally have over 100 bags so thinking okay like what can go wrong with these policies yeah pretty much that's what i think and then somebody asked about New Jersey's environmental justice law. So this is an example. I have not been able to read through it, so I really don't have um, a thought on it. And it's easy to say, or it would be easy for me to feel like, oh my God, we're doing this talk and we're in New Jersey and we're not even talking about this law and we should have an opinion. Well, there'd probably be many different thoughts and opinions, um, but that's just the way it is. We don't all know everything and you don't know, have to know everything either. You can just, jump in where you're at. Mm -hmm. Thank you. I see a comment from Bashir. In my opinion, I believe the issue of climate change for many countries has to do more with the comparison of other internal social issues, like a developing country who's gained independence not more than a century ago will find it difficult to focus on climate change whilst they have unemployment issues, hunger. Bashir, spot on Marian, when Marianne and I teach um, our class, we um, we have a a chart that Marianne had made that kind of shows like this cycle on how like the people who are most impacted, um, as you're describing, are usually least able to um, participate and not just. Um, combating but developing workable solutions that can help them specifically because they're busy with all the other forms of injustices or inequities uh, that are impacting their daily lives and we find that it's um, typically women and children for example that are experiencing this, but absolutely um, injustices do not happen in isolation of each other. Marianne, did you have any other comments? No, I think we could go to the Justice for All video. All right, so let me stop sharing. Or actually, let me share this. So this, is, this video is six or seven minutes long, and it highlights youth-led community organizing. And I'm quite sure that when the youth started organizing, they didn't have a roadmap and they weren't sure and they were probably asking a lot of the same questions that we saw in the chat. Um, and so I hope that you find the video inspiring. And I always think, like, what did the youth think? How are the youth involved? I'm not saying like people who are like 14 should be able to vote or anything like that. I, I think they should be able to be involved in things that impact their community. And it's beautiful when you see the youth involved in making changes for their communities. Marion, can you help me if you hear this? Ready? Yep. I can hear it. Young people of color have historically been on the front lines of struggle and social change. Now, we are facing a climate emergency. All over the world, communities are devastated by the rising tides, storms, fires, horrors, and miseries provoked by climate change. This is Democracy Now! I'm Amy Goodman as we continue to look at the devastating Hurricane Dorian. Her op-ed in the New York Times headlined, Hurricane Dorian makes Bahamians the latest climate crisis victims. We've been the ones affected our communities, the low-income black, brown communities, have been the ones affected since slavery, since colonization, since the genocide of indigenous people. We keep on fighting, keep on fighting. Having young people know about these things and have an understanding of how different things like migration, like policing, like displacement are, are connected to climate change is really important. Once again, the youth are at the forefront of the climate justice movement while ushering clean and just solutions to their communities. All the while fighting against the culprits of climate destruction in their communities and winning. Well, it has been a problem since it opened 33 years ago, but now the Detroit incinerator has suddenly closed for good. We seen it on the news. They didn't even call us and tell us. They let us find out on the news. So we're sitting there chatting about how school was and stuff like that. 
I'm like, yeah, I'm like, oh my God, y'all, look, 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 they shut it down. You know, I got all types of text messages to my phone. Everybody just excited. We did a mental health campaign with another youth organization called CPA. We did an art event, so we had people from the community. Mental health was really important to us, and Poder, they're the one of the reasons why I know a lot about mental health and like why it's important to like um, spread awareness about it. So I think Poder, like, they just, they give us information and like they help us. They're like, what do you want to do? And how do you want to let people know about it? People that are going through the same struggle that you don't, that they don't know is happening to them. Something that we did back home at the Kepper Institute in Indianapolis was create a community controlled food initiative where we outreach to local urban farmers to come to the city and give uh, fruits and vegetables to those um, people who needed food after the food chain store had closed and we were able to increase the farmers social capital. Um, so they were not only like being able to sell their produce but people now knew about them and their farms can be better supported. Para mí ese es el reto más grande de la cuestión económica, de dónde nos sustentamos. Y, y pienso que estrategias para eso, que tiene que ver justo con el tema climático también. O sea, eso, esto es un círculo de muchas cosas que suceden. También es eh, generar microempresas dentro de la propia comunidad que sustenten a gente de la comunidad y a la vez que están dentro, podemos ver qué es lo que nos afecta en el medio ambiente. We have a lot of problems with the militarism in San Antonio. It's actually called Military City, Kelly Air Force Base. Um, they dumped a lot of chemicals into the ground and every time it rains, the chemicals get spread. It takes a lot of contamination to the communities around it, especially low-income communities, brown, black communities. I'm from North New Jersey. I'm an environmental justice leader there. Here at the 5CC, I I do a lot of community organizing in my area. Me coming out here and talking for them, you know, it just warms my heart and I love doing it. We run a garden program every Saturday in North New Jersey for the kids, you know, we have, we teach them gardening, we teach them harvesting and growing crops. We also teach justice and, you know, know your rights. Really what got me connected to the land was just seeing uh, people, people my color and people of my age really making a difference in the community, reconnecting the lines with the elders, um, doing uh, a lot of workshops and a lot of produce markets um, for, the, for the inner city kids. And just, I seen the way that, that food changed uh, people's attitudes. And I seen how um, the garden brought serenity and harmony to, to people's lives. <laughs> Gaspar Sanchez de Honduras y también represento al Copín. My name is Philip. I'm from the island of Guam. One person can change a lot. We all come from different places. We all come from like Guam, Puerto Rico. I think that's really important, and not just in the United States. You know, people need to come together as a whole. It has to be intergenerational, it has to be youth aligned, it has to be frontline, community aligned. We have to be able to learn from those who came before us. The front lines have been leading on solutions for a long time and that we are building is for a just transition and that climate change conversations can't happen without that framework. What gives me hope is seeing like organizations like when I work for ICC, you know, just go out there and every day fight for the community, fight for climate justice. When the grids go down and when the government shuts down our, our cities and, 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 and our countries and continents, well, we won't have anything to rely on. You know, people are going to be running to the farmers. People are going to be running for these, for these resources that they don't have. How do you feel being involved in this movement? I feel empowered. I feel like I'm bigger than I actually am. I feel like I'm part of something that's going to be great, part of something that's going to make history. You know, everybody knows the system rejects that, but if you don't fight to change it, what's going to happen? It's going to stay the same, it's going to get worse, it's going to keep affecting us in a bad way. So I feel like as long as we're fighting, you know, that we're already winning.
vive pescando, quizás ni terminó la escuela. Eso es real y a pocas cosas hace caso. Lo importante es tener comida y agua en el vaso, aunque se vive arropado por la contaminación. Uno que otro va abrazado al polvo de la adicción. Okay. So how did that land on you? Did it answer any questions, give you more questions? We'd love to hear from you, either in the chat or you can unmute, you can turn your camera on if you want. Hello. Hey, Daniel. Hi, hi everyone. Um, that video actually was really <clears throat> powerful and insightful. I think it allowed me to realize how much power we have as a community and it's just beautiful to see how how the video was showing a lot of the movement being youth led and allowing the next generation to be understanding and cognizant of, of how important the environment is personally for me um environmental justice is something that i had to learn to be more understanding of and try to like see that it's actually a necessity of life. Um, growing up in the Jersey City area, there's not really too much uh, <laughs> healthy environment places. So um, I've always felt limited in, in, in spaces where I wanted to have like fresh air and just like, you know, go to a park and just all that kind of stuff. Um, you know, the area is very urban and so growing up and just the, working to understand myself more and just how I'm evolving as a person I realized that nature is a part of us and that it's literally our essence and um, I've used it to heal um, as a source of my healing process and so I'm just really passionate about just um, incorporating that into my work of healing and just supporting others and allowing others especially communities of color black and brown to understand the importance of, of the environment and how it can be beneficial to um, everything, how you eat, uh, your diet, to how you think, to how, how, how you look at the world. I can go on and on and on. But yeah, this is um, something that's just really important. And that documentary definitely saw that. So thank you for sharing. Yeah. Daniel, thank you for sharing. I loved hearing your voice, your truth, and your insights. It's really powerful. And I'm glad to hear that um, their work has, you know, impacted you. And, you know, just really I'm amazed by everything you've shared. Um, and I, it makes me so happy to do chats like this, to do talks like this, because truthfully, like seven years ago, Marianne and I were like, nobody's going to want to learn about environmental justice and social work, um, you know, and we're like, maybe that's why it's not available. And so I am so happy to be proven wrong um, on a regular basis. So thank you for sharing. I really do appreciate it. Marianne, did you want to comment? Yeah, thank you so much, Daniel. I feel like you touched on so many different aspects, kind of like the word cloud at the beginning. Thank you. It was nice to hear your voice and your passions. I see a comment in the chat or a question. Um, Kim, hey, Kim. Oh, okay, you answered. Yeah, just transition. You you hear that a lot with just transition, especially, Marianne, I didn't read your answer. Did you want to read it out loud? So, yeah, I think that when they're referring to a just transition, it means transitioning from, the transition part is transitioning from a carbon-based um, economy or carbon carbon hydrocarbon-based energy system, like basically oil, gasoline, um, natural gas, to something that's not carbon based, um, which could be like electric vehicles or wind, solar panel, and that that ju the just part means that some communities aren't left behind in that transition. And if there's, there would be new like um, work opportunities, say in a plant that makes solar panels, something like that, and that the the frontline communities or poor communities are part of the new economics of a transitioned energy system. Yeah, Marianne, I was thinking that it also, I've heard it refer to a transition with economics and how we essentially operate with money and 
just the transitioning, I think when I think of just transition, I just automatically generalize it to a transition of a just transition of all the broken systems that we currently operate in that we can't just kind of throw out without um, everything crumbling. So it's really just like repairing uh, from this point on. So uh, did we miss, Natalie, did you see any other questions? Are we good? All right. Um, so let me go back to sharing my slides. Um, I don't know if you can hear my little guy barking. So I apologize if you do. Yeah. He's a very high pitched bark. Okay. So, you know, I'm sorry, I do realize that I moved on to this, but did anyone else have anything to share? It's never too late to go back, as you can tell by the million times that I did it in this presentation. Did anyone else want to share any reactions that they had to, to that clip? Okay. All right. So um, this is our last activity before we open up for any questions or discussions. Um, we really just wanted to take a temperature of the room, if you will, the Zoom room. We want to um, meet you where you are, but we have to know where you are. So um, we just wanted to ask, what does your connection to Earth mean to you? What are your thoughts, feelings, emotions, and experiences in this time? So we'll call on everybody in alphabetical order. Just kidding. <laughs> You're probably like, oh, no. <laughs> you put your answers in the chat. Um, I want to uh, really connect with what Daniel had also shared. I don't know that I shared it in the introduction that my uh, relationship with environmental justice is, you know, relatively new. Marianne has shared that, you know, she, you were out and about in nature, but I too, Daniel, we actually are neighbors. I'm over in Hudson County. Um, so I, I know what it's like to not really have environment around in order to establish a relationship with it. Um, but I, it came about with actually, I went to Hudson Community College a few years ago, actually, um, after my MSW, and I started doing uh, culinary classes. And one of my teachers had us watch a documentary on responsible food raising. I was so traumatized. <laughs> I was like, oh goodness, not all food is raised responsibly. And that's going into my body. And, um, you know, I'm sure I was aware of it at, in some degree, but watching that film, you really can't avoid like images and, and pictures. And that really changed the trajectory of how I viewed things, how I live my life. I am a foodie. So food has guided me in many ways. Anyone else? So, thank you. Kelsey says, my connection to earth is a reminder of being part of something bigger than myself. So see if you can drop something in. It doesn't have to, it can be just what you're feeling right now. It doesn't, I know like you guys probably don't spend as much time thinking about this as I do which is like every day. <laughs> so I put an all encompassing spirituality and interconnection to all that is. But you know, it can just be like a sense of happiness or it can be, it can make you nervous too. I remember asking people about what, what make students in social work practice one, what self-care looked like to them. And one of them was like, I wanna be in a city, lots of concrete under my feet. I wanna be walking around and see the different stores and the busyness of everyone and so everyone's different so nature and then i have had people come to have a, a tiny summer cabin in nature and people will come and be like aren't you scared here doesn't it make you nervous this isn't my thing i don't want to come back so it doesn't have to be all positive at all thanks daniel 
Daniel says, my connection to earth is a part of my spirituality and how it's connected to my healing. For example, walking in the sun gives me joy and allows me to feel warm and whole. That's beautiful. Tim, I see you, you put all, um, in all, I'm presuming. You can let me know if I got that right. Thank you, thank you. Oh, thank you, Kim. I'm sorry I skipped over you because I thought it was a response. Like how people say, oh, that's so nice. I thought it was a response <laughs> to, I told you I'm, I'm not with it, <laughs> to Kelsey. Okay, so you can continue to talk with us via chat and um, you might not have guessed already if you decide to un unmute, we welcome that. Um, so go to the last slide. Our slide is really um, our goodbye, which we're just kind of like outroing, but we'll hang out. Any questions if anyone has any? Um, Marianne, I don't know if you want to start. Yeah, so I wanted to read this quote. Um, um, I think I'll just start by reading it. If you have come to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. Thanks, Daniel. It's so powerful in so many different ways like maybe least of all, but importantly, it, it can inform the helper where the helper doesn't feel like they have to have all the answers. And then the helper feels the connection. There's really a kinship, right? Christine, you're the, um, the, the father, the priest that worked with people who had formerly been in gangs, Father, father Boyle, Boyle for yeah, the talk voice industry. Yeah, he talks about compassion and how if you kinship is more important than compassion, I think is kind of the way he says it. We have to realize that we're all really connected. And that he, he the quote is that we belong to one another. Mm. Right? Yeah. So I, I went to a conference and I heard from Winona LaDuke and Naomi Klein, and um, they were just giving really inspirational um, information that motivated everyone who felt bogged down by like the socio-environmental crises with, you know, injections, if you will, of like spirit and like encouragement that we can do it. And Winona LaDuke, I want to give her credit. She said, if you're not at the table, and I know this is said elsewhere, you're on the menu. So <laughs> she said, so come to the table, make a space at the table. Um, even if you're not sure how you're going to participate, come sit at the table because not only is there room for you at the table, we need you there. And you might find out that you're like, you have the most to offer of people who have been at that table for so long because they've been in certain positions. They may be politicians, they may be mayors, they may be on the school board, and they may feel also like they don't have all the answers and they're not sure what they're doing. And then you come and you, you may be able to see things more clearly. So friends, that's all we have, but we're here. You still got time with us. If anyone has any questions for us, wants to talk about anything. Yeah, thanks so much for spending this time with us. I know it's a lot and it can be really paradigm shifting. So um, I hope that you just sort of let it, let it percolate inside you. Um, I just want to say thank you guys so much for the presentation. And then I have one last thing I want to say before I, I get off is that um, I don't know if I saw this somewhere as an elective. Is there an environmental justice class? Is that correct? Yes, um, there is a class. We're offering it right now. I believe it'll be available next um, semester as well. Um, so we have offered it in various formats. We've offered it in person in Newark, in person in New Brunswick, and um, synchronous remote. So otherwise known as Zoom. Zoom via Zoom. So <laughs> we all log in at the same time. So this semester right now we're running it as a synchronous Zoom class. Uh, so we hope it's offered again next semester.
That was the longest answer to say yes, <laughs> Daniel. <laughs> Yeah, well, I do you. want to say thank you to you all for presenting this information. And I was sitting over here taking notes on videos because I said, I want to use this in class. I don't want to steal y'all class videos, but I, I definitely need a new video. Um, but this was amazing. And I appreciate you all sharing your expertise and, and things. And you will all be able to find additional information from Christine and, and Marianne. They have they are writing book chapters and, and publishing things on environmental justice and social work. So there's definitely more to come. Don't feel like this is it or just the elective and that's the end. There is more to come for this, but we do appreciate y'all joining us and hanging out and hearing about environmental justice. So you all enjoy your evening. Um, and the recording will be available on the School of Social Work's YouTube page. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Have an enjoyable evening. Be well. Thank you.